All right. So my first question, um, and this will probably um, focus towards Tamea and Ronell to get us started if you have some wise words for us. Uh, there's a few of us in the room here from the banking sector. And um, given what's going on in the world right now, we're wondering how might the current environment affect what financial institutions see on the transaction side as it relates to human trafficking? And my second part to that question is more for those of us at the pub here that might not know how things sort of work on the street. Um, is, there, uh, is there something that a way that business takes place differently during a pandemic that might affect how human trafficking presents itself to an investigator or to someone at a financial institution? So I will open it up to your wisdom and answers, folks. There you go. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, such an honor to be here with you guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We're happy to have you, Tamia. Uh, and uh, I would actually like to start uh, offering Ronelle the floor and see if she would like to start answering, and then I'm happy to add my thoughts. Sounds great. Hello, everybody, and thank you, to me. It's so nice to see you um, virtually here. <laughs> so. My work involved in, in human trafficking is not so much on the financial side of it, so I can't necessarily speak to sort of what financial institutions might see, but I can tell you as far as working with survivors, what I'm seeing in the shift as far as how traffickers and ways they're using to exploit young women. And so because of social distancing and social isolation, a lot of the, obviously, strips called massage parlors, going and meeting clients, that has gone away. But I'm seeing a lot of the online recruitment as far as actually doing online webcam, online sex work. And so a lot of the young girls have told me that guys are reaching out to them and telling them that it's very lucrative online work. They don't actually have to have sex with anybody. So it's a little bit more appealing. It would just be sort of self-pleasure type of things. But this is just really a way to sort of break them in, get them in, in the industry. And once they have them, obviously, we know the exploitation will continue. But they're seeing a lot of this and it's girls who are pretty young. So I've had girls as young as 13 tell me that they've been approached about this and because they're also dealing with financial insecurity and financial situations at home with their parents, many of whom lost their jobs, they are considering it. And so I've had to actually have conversations and tell them, no, you know what I mean? This may not quote unquote look like sex work to you, but it inevitably will become that at some point. And this is grooming and this is trafficking. So I'll let you finish to me because I know you have a lot more experience in the transactional and the financial side of it. Thank you so much, Ronelle. And you know what? I just second exactly what you just said. Um, that's exactly what I'm experiencing as well. What I'm hearing from the streets or from the, the girls that are in the game currently, that because it's not feasible right now to be in the game, uh, the pimps literally can't pay for hotels, right? So two things are happening right now. The girls that are, and forgive me for saying that, but the girls that according to the pimp or the traffickers are worth to keep, they're gonna keep them around and they're gonna actually start teaching them to do other related crimes right now, like breaking doors, you know, uh, drug trafficking, packaging, and what home invasions and any other form of, um, uh, criminal activity where they put the girls up front so that if anybody gets caught, it's the girls and not them. So that's one thing that's happening. So definitely the hotel and uh, the, the sex trafficking in a form that we know of and is was flourishing for the last 10 years, it's actually very slow right now. So the sex workers and the sex traffic victims, both, they are literally starving right now. And so imagine uh, having a, a, a girl who's been working for the same guy for three years, but they don't have a home, right? They've been just doing hotel to hotel across Canada. They have nowhere to go right now. So at best scenario, he takes her with him to one of his condos or places and holds on to her until the crisis is over. Worst case scenario, they just drop the girls off and to let them at their own devices because right now they can't make them money and right now it's just an expense for them so financially speaking if you want to know how that translates 
Rona, Ronel is absolutely right. Things are going online right now. So the sophisticated traffickers who have places where they can set up a shop online, uh, that's exactly where they're turning to. Plus, uh, they're using the apps like Snapchat and other apps where they can actually offer online video sexual services and they still take money. So you might start seeing uh, new um, charges on credit cards because these uh these um services still need to get paid so you either see charges through credit cards or paypal or you actually start seeing more pay, uh, charges through bitcoin so these are these are the things that we have heard from the front lines and see interestingly um there's another form of exploitation believe it or not you might gonna laugh i don't think it's funny but just the lengths the traffickers would go to and right now i'm talking specifically domestic sex trafficking and then i will switch to forced labor as well um so for example i have a colleague in vegas and she's monitoring she's an analyst and she's monitoring what's happening online so the ads are obviously decreasing but what's not decreasing is so the traffickers who have dancers for example and not escorts the dancers obviously doing online work but they also charging them to use their songs so instead of allowing the dancer to choose whatever song she wants to play in the background he's going to start charging her for his rap songs to play in the background because it's commercial for him or marketing or whatever but he started he started forcing his stable which is like i think it's 15 girls to use his songs and now he's charging extra money for them too so or or deducting from their online payment that they're making from from online activities so these are the shifts that we are seeing right now and when it comes to forced labor um again because the work uh most of the forced labor is not most a large portion of the forced labor is happening behind doors domestic servitudes that are being slaved in homes they are working 24 7 they're not getting paid there's no difference you can't really detect that migrant workers um and um let's just stay stay with migrant workers depending on what industry they are in if they are actually in the industry that is very much needed right now, like manufacturing, I'm talking to several service providers right now from across North America, actually, who are reporting a high number of uh, survivors or survivors who are escaping right now from the situation because the pressure just got way higher and they're getting in, believe it or not, they're trying to smuggle in even more um, victims to to carry out the labor because there's so much work now in certain areas and they don't want to pay for work so again it's not going to translate right now right away what you will see is online you know purchases for online sexual ads or sexual services what's going to happen is and i think ranel will definitely agree with me is I mean, we've both been in a business, so we know what happens over a long weekend when the man who purchased sex and can't do that for three, four days, what happens after a long weekend? We're busy. I mean, busy. So my concern isn't really so much what's happening right now. My concern, huge concern, is what's going to happen when this is all said and done and we are able to open up the fraud gates and go back to society and to normal uh because the amount of ads and the amount of exploitation is going to absolutely skyrocket that's my concern what do you think about that right now so i completely agree with that tamia um and i was, I was having a conversation with someone else just on to that point that well pimps and traffickers have kind of had to maybe take a little bit of a back seat now even though they still are splitting victims once the social isolation is over and once things go to go quote unquote back to normal i think there's going to be an absolute uptick in trafficking exploitation and i think that so many an increased amount of vulnerable young people because so many homes and families have been displaced you know if you talk to shelters like covenant house that work with at-risk and homeless youth they're seeing an increase of young people homeless 
And this is only one month into COVID-19. So I don't know what's going to happen if this continues for two or three months. I think we're going to have a lot more young people that are highly vulnerable, highly at risk, that are going to be lured into this. And all of a sudden, you're going to see all these pimps who weren't able to make a lot of money. And I think your point too, Tamea, was that they will go to other avenues, whether it's drug trafficking, it's b and it's other things, it's fraud. But there's going to be a push to get all the girls out and have them working and making money. So I completely agree with that. I find that really interesting what you've said to me. So you've got, you've got that eventual wave, but also now you've got, I mean, everybody's out to make what money they can now. And so you'll diversify into other businesses and get, um, get those girls involved in other, like, like you said, break and enter the credit card fraud, I'm sure is part of that as well, or, or charging for songs in the background. So uh, very interesting, perhaps a different financial pattern now, but eventually probably a surge back to a similar pattern as before, but two or three times as much or whatever multiple that is down the road. Absolutely. And just one more thought. Um, right now, what we're seeing is that this is a perfect time, time for traffickers at any level to seek out victims and groom them. Because every single young or vulnerable are at home and on their phones. So, and again, right after this there's gonna be a such a spike on on you know even migrant workers needing to make extra money uh for their family and 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 um provide so the most vulnerable are being targeted right now and that's exactly the time to do it if i was a trafficker that's all i would be doing hunting for my next you know and getting ready for the time when the self-isolation is over. Interesting. Okay, for um, unless somebody has a specific question uh, in the room, Amber does, go for it. I do. Um, so I, I was curious, when you were talking about um, the forced labor, are you seeing people that are being brought into Canada from, from outside of Canada right now? And, and if so, how are they getting here? Yeah. So. I'm talking about the population who may or may not be already in Canada. I would mainly prefer that they are in Canada, and especially in the States, migrant workers that are already in the States. But I'll just give you an, um, an idea. There is still two areas in Canada where the border is wide open, and they can just walk right in, even through COVID, without any papers, migrants. Uh, from Sri Lanka and um, other countries. And so they're just walking right through without any papers, claiming refugee, even during COVID. So yes, the borders, the official borders are open, but there's still two loopholes where they just keep coming in. And that's actually, those are the most high trafficked areas for human smugglers. So this is actually a really good time for human smugglers to get people into the country from the States. And they have been already in the States for the last month or two. They're coming down from New York State. So, and what's happening right now in the manufacturing world, I mean, Walmart, Canada is hiring 10,000 workers right now. So if I'm a human smuggler, which I'm not, I just bought in, say, 50 people from Sri Lanka. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get them a job and I'm going to start collecting their money. There is agriculture. There's so many, so many businesses who need extra labor right now. And they're not going to want to pay for it. If they have been exploiting victims up until now, this is not going to be the time when they're going to become legit. Okay, so what are things for those of us, we've got a fair number of people from the financial sector, um, both um, in Canada, the UK, Japan, um, what sort of uh, items should they be looking for now that may or may not differ from the surge we'll see coming, coming up uh, as we hope for the end of this particular pandemic? What I would do is if I were to look for um, signs or, or how to detect, I would continue monitoring companies and what I would look for is, okay, so their income went way up, obviously, because there's work needs to be done and they have orders, say a manufacturing company, but they employ, they, they payroll is the same. 
So how on earth were you able to double or triple your work order with the same amount of people? Something is wrong. You're not either paying them or something is wrong. There's no way that you can deliver that kind of a payroll. So that's where I would look for specifically when it comes to companies who provide services. And you know what? I would just make a small list of, okay, what kind of a manufacturers, companies, and corporations that are very essential right now and needed? And I would mainly look for like, not necessarily large corporations because they are heavily like regulated, but I would look for like, you know, small to medium corporations who still have factories, you know, out in the nowhere. I mean, Windsor and around Windsor, there's a lot of agriculture that is based mainly on migrant workers, you know. So I would just um, look into my clientele, what they do basically. Are they essential? Do they need to do a lot of work? Is, are their businesses tripling? Uh, are they payroll is matching up? That's what I would look for with that. Again, with sex trafficking right now, I do believe they are laying low. So I would just start monitoring, you know, um, I, would, I would still monitor the, the suspect, suspicious accounts, but what I would do is more is just to prepare when you start hearing in the news that, you know, we're gonna come out of self-isolation, I would put things in place and I would start putting extra measurements in place as far as monitoring and detection. Interesting. And, and Dev, you had a question? Uh, yeah, more of um, something that might help as an answer, <laughs> if anything. Um, uh, uh, years ago, when I was investigating human trafficking in retail banking, uh, we used to get um, groups of um, migrants coming in with a translator into the branch. Obviously, at the moment, we're not getting branch activity um, because of uh, lockdowns in various countries. Um, but even what, one thing I would look at is um, new uh, account openings. Um, I'm not singling out migrants, but something like that. If uh, a particular bank um, is seeing a flux of multiple migrants in a week, in a day, suddenly remotely opening bank accounts, or even if they're doing video calls or selfies, things like that, where there's somebody coercing them translating for them uh it's not a typology in itself but it's something to be mindful of i would say because that's how i stopped one instance uh when they were coming into branches with translators suddenly opening accounts um groups of uh, certain certain migrants were opening accounts um with very weak reasons of why they needed it so similarly remotely if we're seeing um multiple new accounts being opened uh, you know, over a short or even a long frequency, suddenly um, to look into it a bit more to see what's going on. Um, if if that helps, that's something that um, I've noticed in the past that might translate into the digital world now. <laughs> and and certainly as uh, travel bans start to lift, we might see people flowing differently, right? That a similar surge of people trying to, yeah. to hop Looking over. for new jobs and things like that, yeah. <laughs> to me, I had a question. Yeah, I actually just want to you next. <laughs> comment you for your, your efforts and appreciate um, what you did and how you stopped it. And that's actually a very good point. Um, one of the things that we teach when we teach financial institutions is with regards to the prevention. And it's actually, there is a really huge, um, and I'm not trying to promote anything here, but there is a very amazing comprehensive uh, manual for um for financial institutions through the Manchester uh, group. And <laughs> they actually had a, 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 an amazing sector in it about, you know, uh, one of the largest uh, human trafficking cases in Canada. And, uh, and they, they specifically talked about the part how the largest human trafficking case in Canada that actually eventually flooded six, the six largest major bank, it could have been totally stopped if they knew the signs which is who is the translator where these people live and you need to get your own translator in when you're opening an account and get a clear history on your client so i appreciate that comment and it's very much a way of preventing and again if you said what to look for i would definitely second that uh, when it comes to being vigilant after we come out of self-isolation self interesting 
Bob, you had a question? Uh, thanks. M more, more of a comment, and thanks to you and Ronald for your insights today. Really, really, uh, I think we learned a lot. Uh, I was on a call, I think, last week, and I mentioned that if I were a financial institution now, um, I would be looking at uh, uh, younger clients uh, who are now receiving email money transfers that weren't in the past. And if there's a way that your analytics can be that sophisticated to look for a spike in that activity, and that was based on some articles I read where exactly what, the, what was described is um, kids or younger younger adults who are at home were, you know, started exploring uh, the, the sex, uh, you know, the, the, I guess this webcam business during the downtime. And they were just doing it because they were home and they were bored. So uh, I think that's one, one rule that you might consider. And in terms of the the human smuggling and the, the minor workers. I know that I just read an article in, uh, based out of Leamington, Ontario, where a lot of people come up seasonally. And they starting next week, I think, they're going to be starting uh, the flights to bring people in. That's been deemed essential work. And they've not received Canadian applications for those positions. So they're expecting to see a, a large, a larger than number usual uh, people coming in from out of country. But typically in, in LinkedIn, the business model there has been uh, the farmer, whomever is donating the work, would take, you know, would pay them a stipend and pay room and board and then the cash stipend, and they would take them ca cash back you know, with them when they went back home. Now, it's inter it'll be interesting to see what the dynamic is with, with the number of bridges closed, with cash being less desirable in terms of physical notes, uh, whether or not behavior changes or not. So it's something you want to be on the lookout for in, uh, in, in any of the agricultural areas. The last part of that was a bit garbled, Bob. So we're just, um, I think a couple of people are just processing, but if you're, um, if you're able to. Oh. Um... <clears throat> Sorry, I was saying that uh, in Leamington and in uh, some of the other farming countries in Ontario, southwestern Ontario, uh, they've just deemed that uh, migrant workers can come up there now and considered an essential service. Traditionally, the model has been migrant workers come in and the farmer will pay them a stipend. They'll give them room and board, and then they'll pay them a stipend. It's typically in cash. And when they go back home after the end of, this, of the farming season, they, uh, they take the cash with them. It'll be interesting to see how that changes with cash being less desirable in terms of physical notes, whether or not they, um, that, you know, how that changes. And I, something, if you have branches in those agricultural centers, Leamington, um, Tilsonburg area in Ontario, and I think across the country, what, uh, what that model will look like. I'm not sure what, what it might transpire to be, but uh, something you can expect changes in the behaviors. And something I think some people might think um, the problems might go on, let's say, in the big city or some of those things, but in a small town or smaller towns, um, that might look like a very significant rise for those um, for that activity there. Um, I know you mentioned before, I think it was Tamea, you mentioned that the funds are going perhaps more towards credit card and crypto, crypto now as we move away from cash. Um, and I think Dwayne has a question, so I will um, I'll pass it over to him first. Perhaps not, Dwayne, you're on mute. All right, I'm not sure if he's having audio problems, but oh, you there, Dwayne? All right, we'll come back to Dwayne in a sec, but just curious um, if anyone's seeing any sort of activity or seen any trends towards the credit card and crypto um, space as it relates here, um, or whether you had any other questions for the group. All right. Um, so I did have one other question. Um, if I know there's been um, a, few, a few articles recently uh, that relate to 
um, different actually credit card fraud and immigration scams going on. But I was wondering if anyone over the last uh, over the last week or so has seen uh, new scams coming up. So looking as well to our our participants here uh, from around the world. Um, just curious what you've seen coming through over the last little bit. Um, and anything going on in your world as it relates to the uh, pandemic? Dev, go for it. And then Janie, you're up next. Um, yeah, but one I uh, <clears throat> caught recently um, was from the regulator in the UK, the FCA. Uh, they issued um, some guidance to uh, savers, particularly vulnerable elderly customers who might have pensions. It was the specific focus on pensions, um, playing on people's fears that um, because of this pandemic, the markets might be volatile, uh, their investments might not be as worth as much as they, they might have been previously. Um, so they've just advised um, savers and people with pensions to be extra cautious around this time of unsolicited communications or anybody trying to um, persuade them into making new arrangements for their pensions or moving money um, or things like that particularly around their, their their pensions and playing on the fears of the markets uh, to people, which is a different one from the others that I've seen, the usual text messages and emails, getting people to click on links. Uh, that's one that I've um, come across. And another one, which is a unique one, um, slightly, um, it's a mix of, um, how was it? It's a mix of uh, just a, a, a cyber attack and um exploiting for money purposes um is a tar uh, interpol notice uh, targeting hospitals particularly um locking them out of key files uh, that might be helpful for their critical systems um, until they pay basically um whatever the the cyber attackers are demanding which i thought was unusual because they actually tried to make money from it rather than just bringing systems down which is what they did initially at the beginning of the crisis merging two different typologies if you will into into one um and obviously putting hospitals at, at um, in a difficult position if they if they're not able to unlock systems to help save lives i guess <laughs> cyber is definitely um i know from my side of the world too it, it's something that we see it's it's part of fraud it's part of money laundering it's part of everything now because everyone's so many more people are connected whether it's through their own home networks to their work um, or it's critical, it's the one way to stay in contact with the rest of the world while we're all distancing. Um, so it, it seems to definitely form part of a lot of the emerging trends. Um, I believe Janie, you had your hand up and then uh, Amber, you're next. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Because yes. I'm my, okay, perfect. So um, just a quick question, actually a comment as well. Like uh, one thing that I've observed was uh, in companies that are reloading prepaid cards, uh, reloadable cards. Uh, there has been a, um, a spike in the past couple of weeks of uh, requests to reload a, a, like a large amount of, of money into prepaid cards. And, and I think, at least in Canada, the prepaid card regulations are a bit unclear, like especially, I don't know, FinTrack is coming up with a bunch of things in the next couple of um, years um, about regulating prepaid car issuers, but also the companies that manage the transaction and the reloading of those cards. And uh, sometimes the source of funds is kind of like difficult to detect. And many of the, you know, and because those are prepaid car issuers by financial institution, but the company that is loading those funds through or facilitating the upload of those funds, they don't have the information about the client. So I don't know if you guys have seen anything from a, from a payment processing perspective. Uh, any unusual, you know, um, activity from that matter because it's money coming in, especially now with the government granting all that money, right? So I've seen a lot of uh, companies been offering their services, obviously, but that's increasing. Um, specifically, for this particular company that I that I'm I'm involved with, they've seen a spike in the past couple of weeks of uh, unusual transactions when it comes to loading of funds. So. Something that, in, and it doesn't need to be like $10,000, sometimes with multiple transactions of a thousand bucks every week or so, which that client wasn't necessarily doing it before, or brand new clients there, you know, registering with the company to, to, got the, to get those cards issued to them. So I thought it was an interesting 
you know, the organizations take advantage of that particular side of business too. I think Amber, you had showed us a stack of prepaid cards last week. Um, right, that's what. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it over. Uh, Amber, you had a comment, and then I see Tamea has her hand up as well. Sure, and I think um, I think Stephen had said in the chat he has a he has some examples as well. Um, one of the things that that we're seeing, and it's not a new scam, but we're increasingly seeing it, is just people doing impersonations, um, and they're getting pretty brazen. So on any any groups like Telegram or WhatsApp, um, there are people that will impersonate relatively well-known people in the community um, and reach out in ways where they're trying to get someone to send, you know, send funds, send crypto, like do um, do things in a, you know, in a way where they're getting someone to send them something of value. Um, and in some cases, we're even seeing people making phone calls now. And I think that I mean, maybe just because we're we're all at home, <laughs> and so we're we're maybe a little bit more likely to pick up the phone or or pick up a message than we might be otherwise. Um, I've I've seen a couple of folks that I would have thought of as being relatively sophisticated fall for those things. Um, and part of what the scammers have been saying is that like, oh, you know, like this is happening and my bank is being really slow because COVID, or I can't go into the branch because COVID. And so I need these funds or I need these Bitcoins to execute this particular transaction. And if you can lend it to me, I'll pay you back with wonderful amounts of interest. And of course I can do that because I'm this person who's trusted in the community. And, and people are just like, oh yeah, yeah, let me, let me do this for you. Um, and, and boom, funds gone. They're probably anxious for some, from some human contact or communication too, and that much more open to answering those calls, right? Yeah, and, and the scammers are, are preying on our wanting to help each other. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Tamea and then Stephen, we'll, we'll get you on deck. Thank you. I just wanted to do a quick comment on Amber. It's actually hilarious. I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but um, I'm actually involved right now with the company who does prepaid reloadable. And the only reason why is because it is literally the only way for us right now to get funds to the most vulnerable. And so if you see spike in that, uh, the company that I'm, I'm involved in, I'm not gonna name them, but they, uh, they, have, they are heavily regulated by FinTrack and they are actually under visa and they get audited every single month or every quarter. They just got audited, passed with flying colors. And they're one of those companies who actually don't just, they don't do uh, business to consumer, they just do business to business. And so every single account that they hand out and cards are absolutely accounted for. So they, they serve large financial institutions as well. But right now, what I'm doing, what I was asked to do just for four months, because I have a, re, um, a reach across North America for um, service providers and charities is to reach out to the charities and say, hey, if you have clients who can't get groceries, are self-isolated, and you can't send them a frontline worker, send them a card with $50 and just keep reloading these cards for the next, you know, three, four months. So mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. The spike is there. And if you see a spike, some of the reason might be is because you're truly, but, um, but that's exactly what's happening right now. And it's not just uh, charities. There are corporations and organizations who decided to start to send out payments instead of like switching from checks, if, believe it or not, some companies are still doing that. So you do see a spike and I would absolutely be vigilant about that too, depending on, you know, who you're dealing with. Stephen, you had a comment? I was just going to say, Amber, is my 100 Ether that I gave to Vitalik gone then? Is that what you're saying? Because I, I really was banking on that 1,000% rate of return. <laughs> uh, uh, for crypto, and this is between the group, uh, what we're seeing a lot of is people that originally abandoned accounts. So basically, they did some type of suspicious activity. We asked them for more information or their KYC identification documents, and we've heard nothing from them. You're seeing a lot more people come back a year and a half, six months, seven months later, willing to give up their information now to kind of get access to their money. So we're seeing a lot of desperate, uh, desperate measures that way where they're probably willing to take the risk now that they know they see that law enforcement maybe it has bigger and better things to, to worry about. 
Um, and to the point, I, I don't know if maybe to me and Ronell can help me with this, but I would be thinking with a lot of people getting $2,000 checks that are unemployed or self-employed, we might see a lot of deposits and pooling of funds into certain accounts for financial institutions as the pimps try to do their best to collect as much money as they can from their girls. But I'd like to hear your theory on that. Solid point there, Stephen. Ronella or Tamea, do you want to opine on that or <laughs> go for it? Me? Yeah, go ahead, Tamea. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely, 100%. But that's not new at all. The other thing that you might see is, so domestic violence, and I know we're talking about human trafficking right now, but domestic violence is on the rise as well, obviously, because when you are locked in with your abuser, it's just, you know, you take it every minute, versus when the abuser is leaving the home, you know, at least there's eight hours of a cool off period, so on and so forth. So now that, you know, women are leaving or trying to escape from a very abusive situation, they get into a domestic violence shelter. And the first thing the husband will do is they are freeze their accounts or trying to clean out as much as possible. So you see both. You will see the pimp trying to access the funds, uh, her funds. Um, or his funds, whoever, whatever the situation is. Absolutely. And they are waiting. They are definitely waiting. Go ahead, Renell. So one thing I'll add is with that $2,000 that you were referring to, Stephen, it's actually from the women I know who are currently sex workers, they aren't able to access that because there's certain requirements that you need to have had earn $5,000, I think, in the last year. And so a lot of the work is cash basis. So they don't have any proof that they earn this income. So even though other people are able to access that, I've actually heard them say that they won't be able to access it. And so this is leaving them even more of a precarious situation. So, um, and to me, maybe you can, you can respond to this. So because they won't have access to that money, what do you think the pimps will be doing then as far as a way to sort of still maintain some sort of income? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. There are a group of group of survivors who are not eligible, and I'm going to comment on that in a second or now. But there is the other side who are still collecting Ontario Works disability, um, you know, uh, children's rates um, money. I mean, there are girls that I'm talking to, 18 years old. She's living with a very abusive pimp right now because she has absolutely nowhere to go. The shelter won't take her. So she went back to her pimp and the pimp is going to take out all of her money that she's collecting from CES, which is about $2,100. So that's one form of, obviously, they just hanging around with the girls who have. The other thing that I heard from victim services right now that they, the, the pimps are pushing the survivors or the victims to go to victim services, sign up, pretend to be a victim, tell them a story. And I heard this from three different victim service agencies. Tell them a poor story, how you're being a victim of human trafficking, and they're going to immediately get you on with Ontario um, OW or any other services that you qualify for. And then he's just going to start withdrawing the money for himself. So that's one. And then back to what your point for now, the very small percentage who is eligible because some of them still have part-time jobs and they, they send them out to work at Tim Hortons or restaurants or what even hotels, believe it or not. Uh, the small percentage who does or did have part-time jobs and are eligible for the $2,000, you're absolutely right. They are just waiting when they can take that money away from her. So. Yeah, and I think we've got a comment from George as well. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Just a quick comment on, on just to consolidate a lot of the insights that were shared. They were spectacular, to say the least. Uh, in terms of human trafficking, like uh, Ms. Timia mentioned, there is organ donning, there is uh, forced labor, there is sex trafficking. Uh, there is different... Human trafficking is the is the is the means for it, and then there's different ends for the actual means for the trafficking itself. The problem is, uh, but I think someone mentioned it. Forgive me for forgetting, but they mentioned FinTrack, and FinTrack, if I'm not mistaken, they just relaxed some of the rules on reporting of suspicious transactions here in Canada. 
Uh, the problem with that, with a lot of these pimps and a lot of, for example, these girls that are forced to stay home or forced to transition online to a lot of the services is that uh, if they start receiving, for example, suspicious transactions, uh, a lot of institutions are actually have a longer wait period now to, for reporting, for trying to raise some red flags on the stuff. And like Ms. Jennifer said, it actually has a built up demand that's going to be coming in with, uh, with when this stuff, when this stuff uh, hopefully settles down. But I think from the enforcement side, we're starting to see a lot of ag aggressive maneuvering, at least from the international front, uh, from the United States, from Interpol, in terms of human trafficking itself, especially in third world countries. Um, if, if you guys can, can raise some insights on that, I'd, I'd really love that. But either or, uh, thank you for your time. Okay, interesting. So we did uh, bring that up uh, somewhat last week. So I'll recap a bit with the FinTrack piece. And I see Stephen, you've uh, mentioned here that there's a question come in from Peter, who's on the line. Uh, Peter Work, who's listening in. So, um, so, uh, so there's a, a combination of things here. So with the pandemic, uh, FinTrack Canada's regulator has said, okay, we're going to um, allow you to file as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm over summarizing here, um, but it's not that they've said don't file on it in the interim or you can wait to file it. You should, you should do so as quickly as you can, understanding that um, some workforces are heavily reduced from the financial institution side. Um, and then of course, if you do have to file in a delayed fashion, there's VizDonks or the uh, voluntary disclosures uh, for, for the delayed filings. So um, to sort of loop that into what Peter's saying here, I'm going to try and read and paraphrase. Um, so many financial institutions can tune scenarios, so this would be in their uh, monitoring systems, to thresholds to account for human trafficking due to business continuity plans. Um, so uh, this can be, Perhaps, Stephen, if you'd like to further paraphrase, but um, I understand there's some fr frustration with the way this is being implemented, but I don't want to miss uh, what Peter's trying to get at here. I think he basically was saying that many FIs can't, um, they cannot tune their their thresholds and their automatic services and the automatic automation because they're working on BCP right now. So they're really working on a skeleton staff and they don't have the ability to what Tamia's point was, is kind of prepping and getting ready for what might be an influx when this is all said and done. So I think that's might be frustrating uh, for some AML professionals that uh, the banks are just, un they're incapable of kind of assessing and having this ready for when, when we're gonna probably need it the most. Uh, yeah, and I would I would further echoes uh, echo Peter's sentiment there as well, where many of the systems are based on, let's say, the last six months, a year, three years worth of patterned data. Um, we're about to change that, and we haven't seen this particular pattern perhaps in 100 years, or perhaps it's totally different. And as we go back, um, there will be, I think, a lag as we try and get the systems or the humans to understand what's going on there. Um, and, and certainly if that is during a BCP time or a business continuity time, uh, that's going to be uh, extra tricky. All right, um, so we're, we're actually uh, running a little short on time here. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to... Um